Hi there, we're live now. Um, welcome uh, everyone to this uh, panel discussion on uh, disruption um, uh, and the Asian CEO, um, uh, disruption in the age of... Uh, uh, um, so we have um, um, a fairly interesting panel today from actually different parts of Asia. And I'll quickly kind of introduce them. Um, and uh, uh, starting with uh, Luis Miguel Adolit. Uh, um, hi, Luis Miguel. Um, hi. Um, so, um, and there's Ken joining us from Singapore. Ken, uh, welcome to the to the uh, conversation. Sonu, um, Sonu, you're joining us from uh, Bangkok. Uh, um, no, I'm actually in the Maldives. Maldives, okay. okay. It's nice oh. place to be at the moment. So, um, terrific, terrific. Terrific. And, uh, right. and um, this is my view. Wow. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you're Sorry, a, you're you're a you want to make me <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> And Darais joins us from Warsaw. Darais, welcome. Um, uh, so the, the interesting part of this conversation is that we've got a very interesting variety of uh, uh, leaders uh, representing very different sectors and cutting across Asia. Uh, we're missing one person, of course, uh, who hasn't yet joined. But um, you have uh, real estate, technology, legal, and hospitality. Um, you can't get more diverse than that. And um, I'm guessing that at the end of this conversation, you will get a fairly interesting, rich tapestry of the kind of post-COVID challenges that some of these leaders are grappling with, right? Uh, you'll hear it from them. I, I, you know, kind of quickly get out of the way and I've uh, shared with them uh, what we're going to do. Two things. One is to essentially hear from them about some of the challenges that they're kind of encountering in their businesses as they lead through in this whole new post-COVID world. Um, and uh, the other aspect is really that um, the world is looking at Asia as a clearly as an engine of growth. Um, and um, how individual companies and leaders really adapt to this post-COVID world will be interesting because I think it will be watched closely from other parts of the world as well. And we'd probably hear um, uh, very interesting narratives that, that might give us some clues of how, um, how the world is taking this trip. And what are the kind of strategies that we could use? So I kind of jump in first. Um, uh, Miguel, I'll come to you. Um, from your kind of uh, vantage point in Manila, where you're also part of a larger conglomerate. Um, but I know that a lot of your interests are focused on real estate, which is a sector that has obviously been under pressure um, post-COVID. Um, what really, just describe to, for us what are some of the challenges that you've had to um, grapple with. Well, I, I think the, the the issue with real estate is that uh, for most of the buyers, it's a very big purchase. So, you know, the documents are taken very seriously. Um, and, you know, it's hard to get signatures done uh, you separately. Do you background echo noise or is it just me? Yeah, um, yeah. I think... I think if uh, I think in the side of Darius, if he can go and mute, uh, I think the echo is coming from his room. Um, it happens when, when you don't have the, the earphone. Um, so, so basically... So, so basically, the, our sales dropped by 50%, but the surprising is, thing is we still made some sales. And so uh, for the customers that were willing to sign documents and do, you know, record video calls to, uh, to do the transaction, uh, I think we were surprised it got done, but it did get done. That I was surprised that we, we sold 50% of the normal volume. Despite uh, just, just the one thing, Miguel, just one thing, direct, uh, you might need to just unmute yourself, otherwise we won't be able to hear. Yeah, no problem. Go ahead, Miguel. Okay. Yeah, so, so people learn how to do transactions using uh, recorded uh, 
confirmations, uh, verifying identities of scanned documents, uh, uh, you know, e-signatures, that sort of stuff, which has never been done before. No, so that's a whole new way of working. And I think you've raised a very interesting aspect about digitalization, which is in some ways gives us an opportunity to try and also reimagine whole new businesses, right? Um, the post-COVID world, one of the most exciting pieces of that is really in terms of what you could do radically differently. So, um, and I'll come to um, Ken on that because I know Ken's been working both on a fairly significant digital transformation of his business as well as um, using that as, as a pivot to really look at a larger business transformation agenda. Give us a quick sense of it, Ken. Yes, uh, my background is in IT. So then uh, we spin off the IT department into a subsidiary, uh, which is dealing with uh, cyber security. And uh, we started with uh, governmental space. And uh, this uh, COVID situation, actually, I will summarize it, uh, that it is a big learning uh, lesson that uh, I will always say now it's not a matter of how big uh, the business is uh, or or the nature of the business, but it's what uh, sector the business is in. So we, we can see uh, collectively is something I would term it as, uh, maybe you can call it a mandated adaptation of uh, changes. And transformation now is driven by COVID-19. It's not a C-suite, uh, no choice. Everybody has to change. Either you do digital transformation, go online, or then uh, no choice, you have to work from home. And that actually comes, uh, the cyber protection in a different paradigm. Um, and I can see that there is a big shift of uh, business from one sector to another. Uh, for example, the government side, uh, we still get uh, pretty healthy orders. Uh, the private sector is interesting. Uh, I will see from sub-sector point of view. Uh, there are certain sectors they are doing very well during, during this period. I mean, the cleaning, the likes of cleaning company, logistic for online delivery, and then uh, the likes of even uh, gym gym machine sellers or or pet pets uh, uh, sellers. You know, people are staying at home, and then this business went booming uh, for no direct reason, <laughs> no direct reason to them. Yeah. So the the poor thing uh, side that is is that uh, the likes of airline travel. And then uh, maybe even like FMB, uh, they are very badly hit. So we can see, I term it like one side is uh, COVID hit, the other side is COVID lift. So interesting. there's this uh, new world order that we, we observe. Yeah. yeah, sure. So to really understand how the patterns of demand have kind of shifted, um, yes. I'll, I'll come to you, Sonu, because uh, like Ken was mentioning, uh, hospitality is obviously been uh, kind of very adversely affected. I know you've kind of done some amazing work to try and kind of deal with it and bounce back uh, across Maldives. And I, I'm not sure about Bangkok, but I, I listened to your podcast uh, quite recently. Uh, very interesting conversation. So give us a glimpse of what it's been uh, to really deal with the post-COVID world. Right, yes. Well, I think any crisis... Um, in a way, is an opportunity, and it's. Um, I've come to having gone through many crises now in my my career. I'm sort of quite old. Um, it, it's. Um, I, I've come to look at them with a bit of um, how do you say? Um, not not fondness, but um, it, you know, in a way, once you once you address the danger, I, I think there's um, there's a lot one can learn from a crisis because it does give you. If you think about the Chinese word for crisis, it's two characters. One is. Uh, this image of danger, and then the other is this image of change stroke opportunity. And so if you can address the danger, and of course there's always uncertainty and turbulence initially, but once you can get on top of that, then it's a fantastic um, opportunity to change and to evolve, and we need to continuously evolve and change. So we've, we've actually found it um, to be quite beneficial to us as an organization. We've changed considerably. We've re rethought our priorities. Uh, we've looked at things in a way that we didn't before and wouldn't have before. So apart from the way we work, like we're all working now in Zoom, et cetera, uh, which is obvious, um, uh, we, we've also found um, opportunities to think about our resources and um, our skills and our competences that we have 
and to see how we can uh, generate revenue beyond our properties as a result of that. So virtual wine tastings, um, incre- increasing our online retail, etc. And it's my hope that uh, Lao Tzu said good fortune has its roots in disaster. It's my hope that this disaster will sort of sprout a lovely tree of good fortune in the future. And that will be um, some of the decisions we've made now that will build up. And it's my hope that in five years' time, at least um, half our revenues will come from outside our property. So we're, we're looking at way, ways of how we can do that. So it's been, from that point of view, it's been... I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you for uh-huh. Yeah, but, but coming back to um, this point that uh, Ken made, so, sorry, uh, uh, Darius, again, if you could go on mute again, sorry, Darius. I don't know, I, yeah. I, I cannot mute, I cannot mute and unmute, so I have to log out and log in. So if I, okay, so I don't know what's going it's, it's, yeah. yeah. So, um, yes, but, but to answer Ken's point, um, you know, he said that some sectors are doing better and some other uh, aren't. I think within a sector, you can perform better or not. So in our sector, travel and tourism, it hasn't been bad news everywhere. Travel has dropped, but people are still traveling. So they're choosing where. We've been blessed and fortunate to have remote locations, locations that are remote but accessible, and our one island, one resort concept where we're testing extensively. So we, we set up a laboratory. So within a month, we set up a COVID laboratory. Uh, we have a machine from Roche, uh, the latest uh, machine from Roche. They're one of the top three manufacturers of real-time PCR machines. And we're testing all our hosts. So all our employees are tested on arrival, and then again after a week, and then again after two weeks. And our guests are tested on arrival. So they first have to come with a negative test certificate, when they arrive into here, the Maldives, where the borders are open. So we're actually finding that this last quarter will be much better than last year, last year's last quarter. So October was a little bit up. November is a little bit up. December is just crazy. It's, it's completely oversold because there are very few places people can go to. And um, what we found was that certain countries have closed their destinations. So if you're, if you're, uh, if you're a European or a nation going on holiday, uh, you can't go to Sri Lanka, for example, or Indonesia, or Thailand, or Mauritius. So other other destinations that might have competed for that Maldivian uh, visiting visitor um, is, is sorry, the, the visitor to the Maldives is um, is closed. And even within the Maldives, decide to close their borders. So even in the Maldives, some hotels have closed their borders. Uh, so, um, so that means that's meant that um, those sorry close the close their operations. So that's meant that a lot of our um, we, we've we've managed whilst there's less business, we've been managed to funnel whatever there is. So that's been to our benefit. As Henry Ford said, if you think you can, or you think you can't, or you think you will, and you think you won't, in both cases you'll be wrong. And I think it's been a bit like that. We just felt we would reopen. We find solutions to reopen our class. And it seems to have worked off, worked well. Very interesting. And there's, of course, the, the COVID fatigue that prompts people to, I guess, uh, step out and, and try and kind of, uh, um, you know, deal with it, I'm guessing, as well. Um, That's right. COVID has um, brought out the worst of living in an urban environment. Um, you know, lack of fresh air, fresh food, space, privacy, and denied people of the attraction of an urban environment in terms of restaurants, theatre, museums, interacting and engaging with other people. So all we've had is the worst of an urban environment. Successful people tend to be urban. So um, after, after five, six months of isolation and restrictions and confinement, uh, coming to our type of destinations is very attractive, yeah. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, Darius, I'll come to you. Um, um, you've kind of um, um, run a pretty successful law practice uh, out of Warsaw. Uh, tell us a little about, I'm guessing, the legal profession's kind of insulated from the ups and downs of COVID. <laughs> Is it? Uh, actually, first of all, I'd like to apologize for some technical problems. Issues. No problem. It's, it's, no problem. it's not a disturbance. 
but anyway, I cannot unmute and mute when I'm uh, with you right right here. Uh, so actually, uh, I work my way and my route to uh, being at this point where I am is quite complicated because I started as a lawyer and um, tax advisor, and right now we also work in the aviation sector. And of course, uh, legal uh, sector is kind of immune to the uh, situation and uh, pandemic because some people say the worst situation the more lawyers are required and needed, what actually it's not uh, true to the end and uh, true fully. Uh, but anyway, we also were working in the aviation sector, we went through uh, a very difficult period, as our friend said before, not only Horeca uh, sector, but also uh, the aviation sector is like uh, the most serious uh, crisis actually in the civil aviation from the beginning of civil aviation. And of course, we had to decide how to redefine our attitude to business. Of course, uh, this business is actually what we do is uh, based on uh, software as a solution. So within one day, we cannot redefine our business and start start producing uh, covering, uh, face coverings or masks or something like that, because impossible. We don't have such assets and we don't have such people who buy, deal with that and we don't have uh, equipment just to be able to do that. So we actually had to think in the frames of uh, certain possibilities actually can be operating and functional. Yeah? The thing I, I noticed uh, during the pandemic is that the private sector was better prepared than public sector when the pandemic uh, came and when it was uh, out, outbreak of the uh, pandemic. Of course, nobody could imagine before uh, the scale the extent and the results of the entire uh, situation. But uh, actually, pandemic has increased the business risk to an extent that is difficult to imagine. Of course, it forced the uh, companies to introduce some changes in the way of work organization, which uh, previously, for various reasons, were difficult uh, to implement. And I think that the biggest backward of uh, our situation, I mean, our entrepreneurs all over the world was the problem of uh, communication, the chaos of uh, communication and some chaos in administrative, also in uh, legal aspects, uh, which was uh, coupled with uh, some instability. So I think, and I believe, uh, actually, I believe in that also before that, the main thing when you carry out you know, business and economic activity is a perfect communication communication with all stakeholders, your employees, so they know the situation of the company, they know how to behave and they know what to expect in the future, very good communication with the clients, very good communication with your creditors, that they must know that, for example, you are in dire straits right now due to the pandemic, but one day it's going to be over and one day we are going to shut down, for example, your debts. And that was a big problem the problem with the uh, communication. And also, I think that a pandemic showed us that's the end of, I called it, uh, freight container globalization. It's like everything uh, must be changed and will be changed uh, in the uh, future and will differently look at the stocks and reserve. Uh, we are not going to uh, treat it as a uh, completely unneeded and blocking some money, freezing some money, it's going to be like an asset, very important asset in uh, our uh, business. Because if we, for example, decide to ensure our business and our activity, we do uh, actually having all assets and very good channels of distribution and receiving goods for our suppliers, it's also kind of ensuring that our business will work in the future in the way we want it to work, so without any uh, problems with supplies and uh, so on. So uh, I believe that we should right now focus on certain way, in certain way, on responsibility, responsibility for our uh, employees, responsibility for our customer customers, and also we should focus on empathy uh, with regard to all stakeholders. Yeah, the debate of business is about business is uh, driven usually by idea of profit. Yeah? We do in business everything to scale scale it up. Uh, to make uh, bigger profits every year and get on the fast lane as soon as possible. But I think this attitude is going to be changed pretty soon and all our customers and all our suppliers 
uh, are going to also understand that's not the only, fa the only factor which is important in business. As well, we've got so many stakeholders that uh, we must show uh, some empathy. Actually, we're in the situation when we've got a few crises because we've got health crisis, we've got financial crisis, in some countries we've got political crisis, plus social crisis, plus crisis uh, with regard to the climate. So it's like one of the most difficult period, uh, I think in, for sure in our lives, uh, but but I think it's like long, long term, um, the, the crisis with long term consequences as well, consequences uh, like material consequences, but also consequences uh, when we talk uh, to, about our thinking and about, about our attitude to certain things, because I've got such a feeling that uh, just from inside, we all understand that something might be, must be done and something must be changed. And the profit is not only only priority. Of course, everybody, for example, in a company, we've got uh, shareholders and so on, uh, balance sheets and so on. But everybody, I think, starts understanding that there are many things around that also should be taken into consideration. Fair enough. That's a, that's a very interesting, interesting point around um, how COVID has, in some ways, forced each of us uh, as CEOs to really rethink our role um, and uh, think a little more deeply about our broader responsibilities as well to key stakeholders. And I'd, I'd kind of like to listen to each of you because. I think uh, Raj made some interesting observations uh, about how businesses need to um, need to um, engage with with multiple stakeholders. Monu, I just wanted to come to you first. Um, what does business responsibility mean for you in a post-COVID kind of world? Sorry, could you say that again? Because it was different. Does, in the yeah, echo. What does business responsibility mean for you as a leader in the post-COVID world? Right, yes. Well, um, I, I think it's um, in, in these times more than ever. So, so first, I think that um, to be successful as a company in the 21st century, uh, da Darius, it's really difficult. I, I hope you don't... Is it possible to go in and out? Because it's, it's almost impossible yeah. to talk and hear oneself and... Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So I'll log, log out in for a second because Thank you. you're not on mute about that. Yeah. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay. So, so um, oh, that's much better. So, so yes. Yeah, so I, I think um, to be successful as an organization in the 21st century, you you absolutely need to have a purpose, a purpose that goes beyond just enriching shareholders and like uh, ourselves, my, my wife and I and our partners. Um, and paying employee salaries. And, and when you can do that, um, it can create a lot of engagement. Um, and so my job as the CEO is, my, my real uh, job description, if you look at my business card, is actually guardian of the culture. And then CEO is in brackets because um, the, we've, we've chosen job titles in our organization that, that describe the main objective of the job. And for me, it's guarding the culture uh, and creating a culture. So values, a philosophy, beliefs, and a clear purpose. And the crisis is an opportunity to demonstrate those values and that culture and your belief and your philosophy because um, it's a tough time and you can either <clears throat> deviate from them and cut corners um, or you can be authentic and genuine and, um, and, and live by your beliefs. And, um, you know, and, uh, and, you know as, as we've said, um, as I said at the very beginning with, um, you know, Darius mentioned the importance to communicate to everyone, to, to employees in particular. So um, I, I had regular weekly um, um, uh, Zoom calls. Uh, we had our, what you call the CEO Connect, uh, which was a Zoom call. And then we, in addition to that, we had um, uh, newsletters. And as I explained, and then I, I, would, I would make some films. We have digital storytellers at our resort, so it was quite easy. And one of the things I said to our, our, our hosts very clearly is that um, you know, we will. We might lose a lot of money over these next couple of months, but we won't lose our values and our dignity. So I, th I think that's been very important. And as a result, um, we've. Wa I think we've created a greater sense of engagement amongst our employees. 
So they're even more engaged, more committed to Suneva than ever before. Um, and also our partners as well. So I think that's helped us a lot. So a, a crisis is an opportunity to behave in a certain way. And if you do, um, it creates stronger bonds. That's and a terrific, terrific point. You made, um, I think, some terrific observations around purpose, right? And trying to kind of rediscover or relook at one's purpose or commit to it all over again. You've talked about employee engagement and the need for communication as well. Um, uh, and higher engagement that comes out of the, the whole process. Uh, and the desire to serve if you're in a service business like you are. So um, I'll come to, to you, Miguel and Ken, first starting with Miguel. Um, what are some of the um, precept, leadership precepts that you've followed, kind of followed in this, in this difficult period? Sure. Well, I, I think... think uh, uh, First with Miguel, oh. and then I'll come to oh. you again. Oh, sorry, I, I, I heard wrong. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think I think uh, the leadership, uh, any leader of any company, uh, based on what has happened over the last six months, seven months, has a vision of how this crisis has transformed this company. So, as a leader, he's got to transform his company as quick as possible. Uh, faster than his competitors. He's got to strengthen that balance sheet if it's, it's under stress. And he's got to make organization, sometimes painful organizational changes to adapt. And so it's very Darwinian. The one who adapts, the one who adapts most quickly is the one who will survive and thrive. And so every, every leader among us is thinking the same thing. How am I going to execute that change of vision, that change of structure. That's right. Um, Ken, um, what Miguel is suggesting is that um, you need to do this quickly, but, but figuring out how to face your um, uh, transformation is oftentimes a critical thing because you go too fast and you leave the organization behind as CEO. Um, you've got to calibrate that pace. Uh, how did you kind of think about um, the last few months, particularly, which were which were high pressure, I'm guessing? Was it me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I... Yes. Uh, okay. The way I see it is that, yeah, you're right that in a traditional business, when you try to drive the IT portion, uh, then the culture portion is very important. That's why there's, there's a work called uh, cultivating a digital culture, which then uh, I think this thing dealt uh, pretty well with uh, what Suno mentioned, the cultural mindset of things. And the, the few things that uh, Suno mentioned really resonate, resonate pretty well with, uh, with me is uh, especially uh, looking at the organization to have an open mind and to focus a lot more on the culture rather than the structure. Uh, then we need true leaders, not just managers, in time of crisis. And and the way uh, we see crisis as in every crisis, there's opportunity. And also, uh, thanks to Sono for uh, giving a final insight into the way that we can find opportunity within uh, the challenging sectors. Uh, I think in, in Singapore, there are, there are, uh, there's a quite interesting story is uh, we have fishmonger in the markets that sell uh, probably maybe like 50 fishes a day. And then during COVID, they were forced to go online and they actually do some uh, interesting performance uh, and also to market the fish. And end up, there was a day that he managed to sell 1,500 fish, which then it becomes a, a really an unprecedented platform and opportunity for them. And now, uh, situation situation is getting better, but you can see them uh, having an extra uh, channel that they can uh, promote their, their fish and also uh, sell uh, better. So in, in today's uh, situation, I see a lot is um, to have an open mind is very important. Um, we are fortunate enough that a few years ago, we spotted a thermal sensing camera company uh, which sends fever. And back in the back in, in, in our mind at the time, it wasn't so much about COVID-19 because by then, 
uh, back then we didn't even know how to spell COVID, right? We don't know about this thing. So um, we, we, we had this thing in mind is SARS because Singapore was very much affected by SARS. So we thought this could be a business that we go in. So we acquired the company and today the company is doing pretty well. So so it's a, sometimes I wouldn't say it's opportunistic, but be ready for crisis where crisis uh, will bring opportunity and to be able to look ahead and innovate. So there's a saying that uh, we either innovate or evaporate. This is uh, uh, the, the rule of the games out there. There's no choice. Or some somebody would say that we will have to constantly cannib cannib cannibalize ourselves. Otherwise, other people will cannibalize us. Yeah. Yes, Ken, that's uh, creative destruction for you. Um, yes. 101, absolutely critical. Uh, I wanted to focus on the role of technology and, and what's going on there to try and create value for for customers, particularly because a lot of the biz new business model innovations are coming from, um, you know, very, very interesting use, imaginative use of technology to try and create value, right? Um, yes. So even I'm guessing in the legal profession um, and the tax profession, there, there is. Uh, do you see examples of, of AI and technology and data really playing a critical role and disrupting the way that the business has been run. And I'll come to each of you from your, for your perspectives after the rest has spoken. Actually, you are right. And as uh, our colleague said before, a crisis is like uh, a chance in, in disguise, I think. And we've been observing it for you know, a long, long time, also in the legal sector. And I think the crisis uh, and pandemic is also only accelerator of some uh, changes. So we thought crisis one day also will get to this point that we are right now. But anyway, we had to do it really quickly, a few times quicker than uh, we uh, would do that in the normal situation. Uh, but of course, uh, and whenever we talk about that, not only in the legal sector or tax sector, it's also kind of um, social problem because it's like it's related to the some losses in marketplace when we talk about people yeah because automation robotization and so on and also we should think in the future what to do and how to shift those people uh, to different jobs yeah or we start thinking about uh, new models of redistribution of proceeds from uh, uh, for example from a country and i think it's a like bigger bigger social problem right now but and anyway it's like it's very inevitable uh, that we are on the fast line and it's gonna uh, be further and further automation and all those issues. For example, that was a very interesting survey uh, which was made in the United States and people were told if after post COVID they wanna have also online medical care. And the answer was that 60% of people said yes, even if the COVID is over, we wanna have online medical assistance, medical services. It's very surprising because we would say that uh, healthcare services are very fragile, are very sensitive. And regardless of that, people decided that even when the coronavirus is over, they want to just stick to this model of providing services. It's very surprising. It also shows how our mentality has changed, has been really working uh, for, uh, during this air period. So anyway, IT, uh, it's, it's a future, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, internet of things, and so on, undoubtedly. Also in the, in the legal uh, sector, but I think in all sectors, also in those sectors, we would have never thought it's possible that uh, some solutions, some IT solutions uh, will be applicable. No, that's a very interesting point because there are certain things that won't go back to what they were pre-COVID. Um, and, and I'm sure in each of your businesses that you lead, you would have seen some of that, that this is a permanent kind of reset. Um, starting with you, Sonu, uh, in the, the, the luxury hospitality space, um, the Ecotel uh, model that you've built, what's really changed for for forever? Um, uh, what, what would you put your finger on? Right. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, in, in terms of the experience itself, um, that I, th I think, I, I think what, what we, 
gone more towards now is even more high touch and even more uh, unique experiences rather than automation because we managed to test everyone. Um, and so what we found is that people actually like the fact that we're not just no news, no shoes, but we're also now no masks. Um, and, you know, given the context of uh, the last few months um, and where they're living, where they go to a restaurant, everyone's wearing a mask, the waiters, the, you know, anyone serving you. Um, it's very nice to come to a mask-free area where you can shake hands, hug people. But, you know, everyone has been tested. So um, so we, we've actually sort of um, been emphasizing what people are missing. And, and that's been very, very attractive uh, to our guests. Um, I think in terms of how we operate, things have changed a bit. Um, in terms of the flexibility we've had to, had to adopt, this idea of trying to generate revenues offline, you know, online, online, outside our properties, and driving that, uh, the way we communicate and work, uh, all of that uh, has seen significant improvements. But in terms of the guest experience, um, I would say we've gone even more the other way. There's more focus on attention to detail, a spirit of generosity, um, personal personalized service. So even a higher host guest ratio, because we find that people appreciate that, they yearn that, because that is, for, for, we're a luxury provider. And it's um, a word that's always misused. People sometimes say that gold and marble is luxury, but that's not what luxury is about. It's a philosophy. Essentially, it's that which is rare, that which is new to you, but also true, which rings a chord in your heart. And most of our guests, as I said, people who can afford to stay with us and successful are now living in an, uh, an urban area, an urban environment. Got it. Uh, and they've been subjected to what people living in urban environments have been. I, I don't need to repeat it, but I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that or heard of it. And um, and so whatever we can do to take them away from that uh, has been very important. So um, so as far as the guest experience, I know some other hoteliers have tried to de-skill and automate and so on. I mean, there are certain things like we now have a, a beautiful digital compendium uh, which people can use on their phones. So we're no news, no shoes, but we have very strong Wi-Fi. But you can turn it on and off. So in your room, you, you have an on-off switch, but when you turn it on, uh, you can look at the compendium. And what we found is the technology has been very good at sorting out the content much better than you can do in paper. So from those point of view, we're still embracing technology. But what we're trying to do is to ensure that it enhances the guest experience and the high-touch guest experience. Uh, because that's what people are missing, is high touch. You know, they're, they're sort of bombarded with tech, but absence of touch. They've been sitting in front of their computer all the time. So um, so that's that's our perspective, but that's our particular part of the world and our particular sector and what we're trying to do. No, no, that's, that's fascinating. Fascinating. Miguel, uh, Ken, I'll come to you on the question of technology, business model, innovation. Um, do you have any specific experiences to, to share on your from your journey that gives us um, a flavor of what what you've been able to do in this particularly intense period? Ken, starting with you, and then I'll come to you, Miguel. Okay. Ken, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I I would like not like to position that we are capitalizing on the best situation. But uh, the matter of fact is that uh, the current COVID situation actually drove up the demand for cyber protection. Uh, why? Because of two main things. Uh, one area is about transformation, especially uh, digital transformation. Uh, like I mentioned, the fish thing, right? The moment they go on uh, online, then they have application that is exposed to the internet and anything can happen. The moment when employees work from home, and then they are using their home router and no longer there is protection and that is dangerous. And the best thing is uh, now everybody knows uh, VPN and then they collect all the dangerous things and then they use VPN to go into the corporate land. Uh, VPN in the past uh, protects privacy, but today VPN protects virus in a way. It protects virus and deliver it into the company. So there are a lot of scenario change where the demand for special innovative uh, protection uh, is coming along. So uh, to answer your question, I think what we can do is we keep running because we just need to keep innovating to 
be sure. able to protect better because oh. um, recently, if you if you look, uh, you, you could read from the, the, the news about uh, this sector is that 50% of the clicks, especially uh, marketing website, are actually fake clicks generated by robots. Yeah. So, and also for checking of land, security of land, uh, right now we are also using robots, sure. meaning software. Yeah. So there are a lot of automation. And we're, uh, we're about four minutes away. So sure. what, I'll, right. what I'll do is um, I'll quickly go to each of you, starting with Miguel. Um, mm -hmm. uh, share one uh, key um, item on your unfinished agenda. Over the next one year, what is your biggest priority as a leader? Um, give us a quick sense of that in a minute. <laughs> I, I know I'm going to be a little tough. Well, on I think... Yeah. Uh, one is to change the organization and our government uh, to allow more and more digital transactions. Uh, right now, digital receipting, digital invoicing, uh, digital signatures, um, they're not, they're, people are forced to do them, but okay. I think even after this what, crisis, what, they will be the normal need, business. What do you need to do differently, uh, Miguel? It's, uh, we're ready. It's, uh, we have to get the government to allow it, and okay. we've got to okay. allow get the courts to uh, enforce mm -hmm. it. So when okay. there's a dispute, when people see that it's enforceable in court, then people will switch to it. Got it. Got it. So it's it's more about working with the government and ensuring. So, no, I'll come to you quickly. Um, uh, what is that one agenda that you want to put on top of your list? Um, I think it's sort of continuing to evolve and grow. Um, at the same time that we've gone through this. And I think I think my, my uh, key goal is to reassure our team that we've gone through this crisis. As I said, this last quarter is better than the, uh, this last quarter of 2019. And for us, it's over. And now we need to just ensure that we preserve any efficiencies that we've created as a result of the crisis, because it's very easy when you have happy times again to get back into your old ways. So yes. for me, it's a big, big challenge. I just hope that we will be disciplined. You know, it's, 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 it's going to be very important. Sure. And at the same time, really think about a growth mindset. And, you know, if there's an opportunity to really add value to the organization, add value to the guest experience, sure. uh, put, and pursue our projects. There are a few projects that were stalled. Sure. Um, and um, we just want to ensure that people are now excited and enthusiastic to continue pursuing them. Terrific, terrific. Thank you for that. Uh, there is uh, one unfinished agenda, uh, one that's on top of your list. So what would it be? I, you have about 30 seconds on that one. Yeah, there are many questions. There are agenda. The thing is, and I'd like, I would say, very prosaic priority is to ensure the comfort of remote working. So it means that all employees might, must be very comfortable when uh, when they work uh, online because sometimes it's very difficult. The family is working also online and so on. So the idea is sometimes just to rent uh, apartments or rent houses very close to their location and their apartments just to group people just for working purposes from different companies just to not have them at home when you've got, got being taught got and so on. So that's the that's, that's main point. Got it. Interesting, remote working. Um, Ken, quick 30 second response on unfinished agenda. Oh, uh, simple, continue to educate, uh, be open minded, and be positive. So, uh, there are a lot of people are very pessimistic. So, let's uh, be prepared when we can emerge uh, stronger when the vaccines are working and the world is back to normal. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's the hope, I think. Uh, but I really enjoyed listening to each of you uh, because I think um, clearly all businesses and all CEOs have learned quite a few new things. And I think the issue is to try and kind of retain and preserve some of those learnings, even as you think of putting the emphasis back on growth. Um, there I spoke about remote working. Who would have imagined that uh, even, you know, eight months ago, we'd be talking about, uh, remote working as a concept. There are companies who had no experience virtually of, of remote working or hybrid working, but they're now thinking about it because the opportunity has presented itself. Who would have talked about digitization, right? So um, of the kind that Miguel was talking about, 
but all of that is possible. So I'll um, I'll have to stop here because it's unfortunate. Thank you uh, that we run out of time. Uh, thank you so much for okay. each of you, Rais, Sonu, um, uh, Miguel, and Ken. Really appreciate your perspective, and thank you for the audience for logging in as well. Sure. Thank you. Appreciate. It. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 All right. Bye. 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 Bye.